good afternoon uh, everyone uh, a very very warm welcome to professor uh, mala pandurang uh, for being part of the the golden jubilee celebrations of the school of social sciences uh, it's only a coincidence i dare say that the golden jubilee of the university also coincides with that of social sciences <laughs> Uh, I'd like to believe that we came first and then everything else flowed. Um, and rightly so, uh, that's how it should be. And if you are all uh, expecting me to say what I've said in the last eight lectures, I won't. Uh, because it's, it's self-evident that uh, uh, we set the agenda for everything that's precious and well worth holding on to um, as a school, as colleagues, as a community of scholars and students. And I think I think these, these eight or nine lectures are a testament to our commitment, our tenacity, and, and our sincerity. So what I'm going to do uh, this afternoon very quickly uh, is to say, a big thank you to what I call my team. Um, every department uh, who has participated in uh, these lectures, and it has been departments suggesting speakers, and we getting them, and the department heads then hosting the talk. Uh, uh, every department has uh, uh, sent us student volunteers, but there is a core team uh, and I'd like to thank them for being there. Um, one of them asked me the other day, uh, what will we do after this? And I said, your PhDs. Uh, lest I be blamed for uh, delaying uh, the writing. Um, so I thank Prathvi, Sadhiki, Chiang Mong, Rajat, Atul, Shreya, Tongming, Pradeep, Suraj, and also uh, the wonderful staff uh, of this auditorium, uh, Shrikant, Krishna, uh, are uh, very generous uh, videographer, Achyut, um, and uh, Pandu, who has helped him. Um, uh, volunteers today, uh, uh, Biba Babu and uh, Akash, uh, thank you for uh, working for this afternoon, as well as uh, you have done. Um, this is only the end of the first series. Uh, the second series starts in July. Uh, July, August, September, three months. Uh, September will also have a huge conference between the 12th and the 14th of uh, September uh, on the theme of uh, are there Indian ways of thinking? Uh, a play on Ramanujan's original essay. Uh, where things were rather singular. Uh, and then a huge methodology conference for the third, coinciding with the third series in November and December, where we hope, hope to have also participatory workshops and also talks uh, by national and international speakers and faculty. So uh, all in all, uh, we will celebrate uh, the Golden Jubilee of the School of Social Sciences, as only we can, and we'll do it together. Uh, we'll do it with great joy and uh, profound and grateful thanks to everybody for helping, for being here, and making this first series a success. Thank you very much. Now I invite Professor Ajay Sahu to uh, introduce Professor Pandurang and uh, chair the session. Professor Sahu. Um, 
before i introduce the speaker of this afternoon professor mala pandrang i would like to thank you professor uh, jyotima sarman the dean school of social sciences for giving this opportunity to the center to be part of this ioe golden jewel lecture series i know uh, because i don't want to praise because uh, this is has been there for the last all the heads they have told about the activities professor sarma is doing for the uh, school as a whole but uh, I, I can say that uh, you have been a forerunner of, you know, like academic integrity and uh, has been on our appreciation for your uh, effective leadership as the, being the dean and uh, your all these academic visions, you know, and uh, we, you know, uh, look forward to much more activities, such activities in the future as well and uh, appreciate your effort in this regard. You are so amicable in nature in... Uh, your amicable nature is commendable, sir. And uh, as we can approach you for, uh, you know, like a smooth interaction at any time. So thank you so much, sir, for that. And uh, I would uh, welcome on behalf of the Center for Study of Indian Diaspora and on behalf of the School of Social Sciences, I welcome Professor Mala Pandurang for this uh, IOE Distinguished Lecture Series. My association with uh, Professor Mala actually started uh, from 2008, since I, when I joined the center as a young faculty. So I started this journal called Southeast and Diaspora, which was, uh, you know, I when the pro proposed the journal to the rootless London. So I had to constitute an international editorial advisory board, but I need some support from that and. Uh, Mala, when I approached Mala to be the reviews editor of the journal, and uh, she was uh, very much keen on that area because her areas we are acquainted with before that, and uh, she said yes, and uh, she was part of the journal from the beginning, and thank you and uh, for that. And uh, I can say that from the last year, it has gone into the impact factor, and it is now leading, all the leading uh, indexing services, it is now you know, indexed. So, <clears throat> Professor Mala Pandurang, as you know that, uh, she is now the currently the principal of the Dr. BMN College in Mumbai, Home Science. So she was a postdoctoral fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Germany, and has been nominated as the Ambassador of Scientists to India, a post which she is holding since 2019. She was also a Fulbright visiting professor at the University of Texas at Austin, in 2022, she was a fellow of the first Humboldt residency program in Berlin as part of an international cohort working on a project on social cohesion. She had completed several collaborative research projects to her credit and uh, she could grant from all international leading funding agencies including Charles Wallace India UK Foundation Research Grant UGC Major Research Project, Fellowship from the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, and Indian Institute of Advanced Studies. Currently, she is carrying out a collaborative research project on South-South Feminism with the University of Stellenbosch, funded by the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences, South Africa. Her areas of research interest include post-colonial writing, diaspora theory, and gender studies, and she has published extensively on these areas. In 2012, she was uh, received the SNDT Women's University Best Teacher Award from the government, Governor of Maharashtra. She is associated with the journal, as I told him, with the South Asian Diaspora. Still, it is continuing her association. And currently, also, she is the series editor of Post Colonial Lives by Bill Publication. With these few words, I request Professor Mala Pandurang to deliver this today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sharma, and also Professor Ajay Sahu for this very warm welcome to an extremely warm Hyderabad. It's a nice feeling to be back. <clears throat> I think for of, after almost 15 years, if I got it correct, and to meet old friends, I can see Professor Bhatt here, Dr. and Professor Aparna, and I'm sure by the end of the day, new acquaintances and new friends will also be made. As uh, Professor Ajaya was sharing, our association goes back a long time. 
And I am grateful to the Center for Diaspora Studies for actually giving impetus to my own work in this area, which I've been trying to follow up for the last decade or so. What I've tried to do is I have um, divided my talk into three parts because Professor Ajay did tell me that the audience would be a mixture of undergraduate, postgraduate research as well as faculty. And therefore, you know, it's always a little difficult. How do you pitch it? So I've tried to do a combination of a whole lot of things. And my talk is divided into three parts. I will begin with an overview of the historical context and the types of transoceanic migration from India. And this is a period that I'm particularly looking at from the mid 19th to the early 20th century. And in doing so, particularly in the second part of my talk, uh, I would like to demonstrate, I'm a person with a literary uh, background. My, my entire training has been in the area of literary studies. But today, I don't think that any discipline can actually function on its own. And we all are into a transdisciplinary mode of looking at whichever subjects we are researching into. And so in the second part, I'm going to try to apply a transdisciplinary lens of archival studies, history, social sciences, to select lit literary narratives, as time permits, as a method of excavating gendered experiences in the context of the old Indian diaspora. And as I conclude the paper, I will very briefly touch upon the importance, especially in today's context, for us to start developing South-South rubrics, which will allow for multi-locational feminist historiographies to be read along with each other and not to be read independent of each other, because the connections which we can establish go way back. And these are not recent connections, or these are not even post-colonial connections. They can be established, and a kind of continuity can be shown so when you talk about the old diaspora, you're not talking about something that has been and therefore should be looked only as something that belongs to a historical past. Now, diaspora, the term has exploded. It's being used in multiple ways. It's being used as an umbrella term for almost anything that has to do with migration. Uh, in fact, it's being used rather loosely nowadays but I would just like to kind of specify in the context of my presentation this afternoon, I'm using the term diaspora as Stephen Vertovex uh, has defined it, as a population, a sizable population that is deterritorized, that leaves the sending society, goes to a receiving society, movement between these societies that makes it transnational, it has originated in the land other than in which it currently resides, but whose social, economic, and political networks cross the borders of nation states or indeed span the globe. So when you look at this definition of diaspora, it becomes important when I talk about diasporic subjectivity in the latter part of my paper. When we talk about diaspora again, this may be a kind of a little bit of input for those who may not that be that familiar with the diaspora studies. Diasporic scholars talk about diasporas in waves. Okay? And they generally tend to define it into two categories, the old Indian diaspora and the new Indian diaspora. And within the new Indian diaspora, you again have these, and it's important to look at each of these movements in their particular context to avoid any dangers of homogenizing the idea or the concept of Indian diasporic movement. In the 1950s, you had, and this is known as the post-colonial movement, post-colonial phase, post-independent phase, you had the recruitment of labor for the purposes of post-war reconstruction in Britain. And by the time you come to the 1960s, you have a large movement of people who qualified, skilled professionals are moving to the USA because suddenly the United States changes its migration policies, 
Whereas earlier to this, before the 1960s, Asian migration was not encouraged at all. And so you have these waves of people now heading for the United States. By the 1970s, you have Indian labor that is moving towards a Gulf area after the oil boom there. And then by the time you come to the 1990s, you start having increasing number of movements of skilled professionals. You know, you name the profession and we are there, including English teachers. Okay? And locations now go beyond just the UK or Canada or Australia or the United States. They move into Eastern Europe, move into many other locations where sizable communities were not there earlier. 21st century, we have the phenomena of student communities, shifting of mobility patterns. And again, if a lot of debate is, do you consider this a diaspora at all? Because if you say a diaspora is where the shift has occurred, they've been deterritorized, then when there's a frequent return back to home, and people are now traveling with a two-way ticket, with the premise that they will return, then are we moving into transnationalism, or do we still talk and look at this movement in terms of diaspora? Okay. So this is the first wave, and I'm not going to touch on, um, sorry, the new wave, as diasporic scholars would term it. But may, my main focus is more on the um, old Indian diaspora, and this is the colonial Indian diaspora. And again, the colonial Indian diaspora is generally looked at in terms of historical periodization as well as the geographical scope. Because these two are very important factors when again you're trying to define the individual characteristics of this diaspora and not making the mistake again of having a uniform kind of generalized statement of what kind of um, fits into definitions of diasporic subjectivity. So the first, uh, I just walk you through these categories. The first would be the intentioned labor coolies, um, mainly to the British colonies of Fiji, Mauritius, the Caribbean, South Africa, among others. With the abolition of slavery in 1833, which abolished African enslavement through the British Empire, this resulted in a massive desire and a massive demand for alternate supply of cheap labor to meet the growing demands to replace the African labors on these plantations, sugar, coffee, tea, and other cash crops. And the colonial agents and the colonial authorities turned to India for this purpose of recruitment through agents. And this has resulted in a mass mobility and relocation of an estimated 1.25 million 1.25 million Indian men and women to far-flung colonies of British Guyana, Trinidad, Jamaica, Fiji, Mauritius, South Africa, as far as the French colonies or, uh, or, and uh, minor Danish and Dutch colonies. And this takes place from 1830s to 1920 when you have the final abolition of indenture. The indentured laborers were also known as bound coolies because they were required to sign a formal contractual agreement with the colonial landlord, which dictated the fixed period, the wages that they would get, the accommodation they would get in exchange for passage to the colony. And you also had the term, therefore, the grimitwala, the agreement wala, which evolved. And what you can see here from archives, you can see here is the uh, sample contract for the laborer, okay. which the laborers were supposed to sign through agents, and the sample contract for a recruiter who was recruiting labor for Trinidad. Okay. You can see the rates that each um, um, person that he picked up, what was the age group, what was the negotiation that was involved. Okay? It was the severe famines of the late 19th century, the drought, the poverty, 
the exploitation under the colonial expansion of colonial capitalism, which were mainly the push factors for this huge number of labor that went primarily from the north of India to these far-flung colonies. And the term Kalapani therefore comes as a recurrent trope. And it's used many times in discussion of indentured labor in the act of crossing the black waters. Kalapani, which was forbidden, you know, they were not supposed to cross the class, uh, the black waters. And for very long, it has been applied as a generic term to describe the psychological trauma associated with the perceived loss of caste, which these migrants were, migrants were assumed to have experienced while crossing the Kalapani. This interpretation, however, has been challenged by a number of scholarship scholars in recent times that the idea of contamination need not have necessarily impacted upon those migrants who were not high caste Hindus who might conversely have actually welcomed the disruption of caste and gender hierarchies. This is again the, uh, one of the forms from the archives which gives you the certificate of discharge. What happens after the migrants get the certificate of discharge because of debt, because of the long passage back, because of financial constraints, because of the nature of bonded labor, hardly a minute percentage actually come back to India. The next category that we're talking about is the contracted labor migration, which is also known as the Kangani or the mystery system, which went from Tamil Nadu, and it was used to recruit labor from erstwhile Madras presidency to Burma, Malaysia, and Ceylon, mainly between 1852 and 1937. We don't have the exact figures, but it is estimated around 6 million migrants. What you have here is a photo of Tamil migrants working on the tea plantations in Ceylon. Unlike the indentured system, these migrants were free in the sense that they did not have to sign a contract for a fixed period of service, but they, do, they too were caught in a very complicated network of middlemen who thrived on creating a debt relationship. And the ex-indentured or ex-Kangani or Maestri laborers who decided to stay back in their new locations came to be known as free Indians. Now the third category of um, under the old Indian diaspora, and this is the area that I have been working on, and this is the pattern of emigration called free passage emigration. And free passage emigration mainly took place between, as you can see, the western coast of India and the eastern coast of Africa. They were not bound by contracts. The passenger Indians set sail on their own initiative and paid for their travel, and hence the term passenger Indians. But they were also sometimes referred to as kula, uh, open immigrants, as opposed to the bonded or the uh, indentured labor. Trading communities from Gujarat had had centuries of mercantile tradition, as you can see, you, east coast, the west coast from Saurashtra right down to the Gulf of Yemen, and then sailing down to Mombasa, to Zanzibar. This was a, a trade that went centuries, predated the coming of the Europeans. But it was the British East African authorities, British East African colonial authorities, who considered East Africa as an extension of British India, who realized that the traders could play a vital role in introducing organized commerce via, uh, that would serve British trade interests in the interior areas. And therefore, these traders were encouraged to start moving inland. They would move inland, set up a boma, set up a trading house, um, center, as the trade started to grow, then the British administrators would move in. This was the general pattern that they followed. Okay? And to enable the influx of traders further, 
the Kenyan-Ugandan railway line was constructed. And this was a railway line that was constructed from Mombasa on the eastern coast of Africa. It went right up the uh, highlands uh, to Nairobi, and from Nairobi it went further down to Kisumu, where you have the Lake Victoria, and the Lake Victoria uh, has these three countries as we know it today, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania bordering the Lake Victoria. And it is for this purpose that 32,000 laborers from Punjab were hired as indentured laborers. Many of them returned back to India, about say 6,000 stayed back. But interestingly, in order to run the railway line, uh, station masters, clerks, and other white collared workers were taken from India, the Parsis and the Goans, and the Sikhs. Okay. So you have this kind of heterogeneous population of the Indian diaspora within East Africa also. Okay. Um, Peter Nazareth writes extensively about the Goans in East Africa, for example. So you have this British Empire, and you have um, this kind of movement where petty traders gradually replace the barter system. And over time, this term Dukawala, Dukanwala, okay, becomes a term of economic ecological identification of Asians in East Africa, gradually leading to growing resentment and eventual expulsion of Asians from Uganda in 1972, and the nationalization of Asian property in Tanzania around 1967, around the same time in Kenya. Similarly, the presence of migrant population in the colonies like South Africa, which had a large number of indentured labor, necessitated various kind of bureaucratic and commercial services that would cater to the growing community of migrant Indians. You also had a group of passenger Indians going to Burma, mainly as skilled laborers, teachers, doctors, lawyers, engineers, and also Indian bu bureaucrats who were used to administer Burma and the Natukote Chetiars, who were used as traders and sent from South, Af South India, who played a vital role in transforming Burma's subsistence economy to commercialized economy. But as in Africa, when you have this pyramid with the traders in between, leading to resentment among the local population, and eventually leading to the exodus and expulsion of Indians in the 1940s. In terms of the trans-oceanic migrations in the period that I'm talking about, the this travel to diverse nodes of diasporic geographies of the colonies inevitably involved journeys of transoceanic crossings across the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, and the Atlantic Oceans. And this is a very important characteristic of the diaspora because it meant that there was a prolonged um, temporal span between the homeland and the receiving society. Okay? And the sea and the ship become important tropes of departure, of transits of passage. We become recurrent metaphors whenever you look at writing that has emerged from the diaspora. Um, Cynthia Salvador okay, has a three-volume publication which offers reconstructions of passenger migrants' journeys across the Indian Ocean on Daos, because this was a system of movement from the west coast of India to the east coast of Africa. It took around two weeks for a Dao to come, dock in Mombasa, in um, Zanzibar, trade happened, and then they would wait for the southeast monsoons for the Daos to return. And this is a very interesting kind of archival reconstruction from families of the journeys that first took place in Daos and later by steam sheets to the ports of Aden, Kalindini, Zanzibar. And in a way, the temporal span of this journey is an important defining characteristic 
of the East African diaspora as against the much longer passages across the Atlantic and the Pacific, which extended into months, making return a near impossibility. While there is a sizable body of scholarship available on the legacy of the indentured diaspora, you have writers like Brijlal, Vijay Mishra, Ashutosh Bharadwaj, uh, Tinka, Ashutosh Kumar. Meaning, there's a, there's a big list of scholarship. And maybe this is facilitated because a reconstruction of indentured experience is facilitated by the archival repositories which holds emigrations at ports of departure such as at Calcutta and Madras, as well as documentation at the ports of arrival. Okay? Now, how does this make a huge difference? It means that it's well documented. Who left? When did they leave? What was their age? Okay? There is some sort of documentation there that now you have these museums of indentured labor. You have them at Mauritius. I think you have one at Calcutta also. So you do have archival records. There is a perceptible gap in the information as historiography of passenger Indians are concerned because there are very few passenger lists and port records to capture the finer nuances of gendered individual and collective mobility. I did make an effort of, um, it was mentioned that I'd got a Charles Wallace grant. I spent time at the, um, the British Library, which has these huge records from the colonial office trying to see whether there is kind of documentation, who left on the ships, um, names, where did they live from, but there's hardly any concrete information to go by, especially where women are concerned, because it would be Mr. Shah plus three, or Mr. Patel plus two, okay? So who are the plus two, okay? It, they just remain in those terms. Now, an alternate method of excavating an archive of information, and this is where I think the training in literary discipline comes in, is to take a transdisciplinary lens to the body of diasporic literature, this huge body of writing from the diaspora comprising life narratives and fictional histories. Social scientists, historians offer statistics, analytical perspectives, of political, economic, demographic conditions of migration. As literary theorists, what can we bring to the board? We can engage with a narrative as a window of subjective insights and multiple perspectives into both the world of the individual immigrant as well as the larger connect with the collective. In telling of stories of the self as subject, there is an intersection of the individual with larger forces of history. Diasporic writing or literature is characterized by the personal quest of writers to re revisit their roots through the roots of their ancestors. Diasporic writing that you have today as a genre, as a literary genre, is usually by second, third, or even fourth generation migrants who are um, negotiating what is known as a sense of in-betweenness. Okay? A sense of where do they belong. Okay? When we talk about diasporic subjectivity, which I'll come through shortly, ambivalent questions of idea and belonging, hyphenated identities. And importantly, this body of texts offer an artistic inquiry of the past, connecting it with the present. Uh, let me demonstrate this point. Through uh, the authorial intention of three women writers who offer a gendered perspective into the history of indenture by embarking on a literal and metaphoric journey in search of the lost identities of women in their family. 
Their narratives are based on family memories as well as deeply researched archival material. And in the process of trying to retrace the routes that their great-grandmothers took, the writers imaginatively recreate the unheard saga of a quarter of a million women who crossed the ocean, presenting to us what Brinda Mehta refers to as the maternal roots of the Indo-Caribbean history. In Cooley Woman, Goitra Bahadur accesses the immigration pass issued on 29th July 1903 to her great-grandmother as a starting point to reconstruct the life narrative of her great-grandmother, a high-caste Hindu who set sail from Calcutta for Guyana as a single pregnant woman. The narrative describes how indenture, which effaced her great-grandmother's identity, is not restricted to a single person. Rather, and I quote from her, Bahudu says, and I quote, she was one individual swept up in a particular mass movement of people, and the perceptions of those who controlled that process determined her identity, at least as much as she did. The power of the colonizers to name and misname her formed a key part of her story. Similarly, you have another text by Ramabai Espionat called The Swinging Bridges, wherein she also recreates the exilic passage of her great-grandmother, Gainda, from India to Trinidad. Once again, this is a life story of a woman who goes as an indentured woman, who is labeled as a sex worker, and who's through whose history we are presented an unconventional, unacceptable at that point of time sexual history. The third narrative is Peggy Mohan's Jahajin, which presents a gendered experience of 110 year old Dida, who set sail on the same ship as the narrator's great grandmother. And this term, Jahajin, derived from the term Jahaj, the boat, and Jahajin referred to Indians who made the journey on the boat, and the child born on the journey was also called a Jahajin. And Amitav Ghosh in The Sea of Poppies presents the trope of the sea as providing time and space for the formation of what he calls as ship, ship iblings, shiplings, okay? And what you have similarly here, you have this bonding that takes place on this long voyage, on a voyage of difficulty, bonding that takes place on arrival, and this kind of sisterhood that emerges. What emerges as a cross-sectional, daughter-centric perspective of headstrong woman in the family who asserted a certain degree of agency to undertake risky migratory journeys across oceans to express an oppressive patriarchal society. And this connects with the observation by Delory that Indian women were much more mobile than described and not as constrained by social conventions as previously assumed. And they should not therefore be examined only in terms of victimhood. Now to continue with a doctor-centric perspective but from a much more personal perspective. This is my mother. Her name is Savitri Siva, and she's now 92. She's a remarkable narrator. And I grew up on her engrossing stories of how she sailed from Mumbai to Mombasa as a young bride in the 1950s. And she made the journey on the railway from Mombasa to Nairobi, from Nairobi to Kisumu, down into the Rift Valley and by steamer right to a small coffee growing town called Bukoba. She worked as a stenographer, the only Asian woman who worked in a colonial office. And I think that she got her gift with words, kind of honed it further at the typewriter there. Okay? This is the journey that she took. 
But when they got to Bokoba, the small coffee growing town in Bokoba, right in the heart of Tanzania, there, right in the heart of Africa, she and my father came into very close contact with the Asian community of Ismaili Kojas. My father had been appointed as a principal of a public school run by Kojas, and he had no idea when he accepted the job that he would be going and he would be the principal of an Asian school run by Ismaili Kojas. He thought it would be an African school. Now, the Ismaili Kojas are a fundamentally entrepreneurial community who have played a very vital role in enabling the commercial expansion of the British Empire in East Africa. My mother, and I said she was a wonderful storyteller who would engross us with all her stories. Her stories were always intertwined with the multi-generational history of Ismaili Koja women in the community who had told her stories of their own grandmothers who arrived in Africa at the turn of the century. So you see how it works, okay? She's talking about 1950s, but in 1950s she interacted with women who talked about the stories of their grandmothers who arrived in Africa at the turn of the century. And this perhaps has fueled my own quest for transoceanic narr trans narratives of East Africa from a gendered perspective. Especially when I came to realize that there are hardly any records on the arrival and settlement of Indian women who in, came to East Africa, joined their spouses in East Africa, except for uh, a few mentions, Dana Seinderberg's chapter on forgotten pioneers in East Africa is one of the rare attempts to bring the badly fragmented lives of women together. Several of the women passengers of passenger descent whose husbands came as traders led what Kalpana Hiraral terms as transnational lives. They managed households in India while their husbands were in Africa attempting to build businesses and traveled only after their spouses had established their livelihood. And the absence of wives is marked through, for example, the semi-biographical account of two lead entrepreneurs. And when I see it, lead entrepreneurs, these were, in today's words, you would call them kroorpatis, but in those days, they were entrepreneurs who went and made their millions in sugar, in agriculture, in industry, Nanji Kalidas Mehta and Madhwani, okay? Madhubai Madhwani, and Nanji Kalidas Mehta's dream half expressed describes 45 journeys undertaken from 1901 to 1961 between Africa and India and within East Africa itself. He is married around 1900 at the age of 13 to a 12 year old, but does not mention the name of his bride even once. He however comments that the marriage was an obstacle to his path to success. He remarries again under pressure for the commun community at the age of 32. This time his bride is 16. But again, there is no insight into the life or the relationship with the young bride. The projection of women is subsumed within the larger collective history of their husbands or fathers led me to take up a major research project with the University Grants Commission, which I termed wives, mothers, and others. Because I was really curious and anxious to find out about the category of the other. One of the most well-known literary works of fiction from the East African diaspora is the first Tanzanian Asian novel by M.G. Vasanji, The Gunny Sack. And interestingly, a seemingly male-centered narrative is punctured with accounts with the lives of four generations of women from the Kachi Gujarati Shamsi family, and it has no less than 26 female characters from a range of linguistic, ethnic, and religious backgrounds, including Punjabi, Goanese, and Christian, once again reminding us that the composition of women in East Africa is no means homogenous. 
They are passing references to a midwife called Janabai, young Yasmin, who is going to London to become a nurse, and the protagonist's wife, Zuleika, who is a teacher, compelled to give tuitions to support herself as a single mother. And then as I began to widen my search, I came across the fascinating work of an ethnographer, novelist ethnographer called Sultan Somji. Okay. Somji has worked extensively with the Peace Museum in Nairobi. He was instrumental in setting up the African Asian Heritage Museum in Nairobi. And he was also known for his work with the indigenous communities in promoting this concept of a peace museum. But apart from that, he has two fascinating historical, um, you could call it histo-fictional works, Bead Bice and Home Crossing, where he offers a rare gendered perspective into the multi-generational and transnational life histories of Ismaili Koja women in colonial and post-colonial Kenya. The title of Focus, Bead by focuses on the role that women in the community played in the trade of beads with the ethnic tribes such as the Maasai and the Kikuyu. It was not uncommon. So Mchis, um, grandmother was a bead by, and he kind of uses family archives and family memories to reconstruct the story of the bead buys that when the merchants went into the interiors to trade, the merchant's wife, mother, daughter would handle the store and they would trade in beads which were mainly imported from Czechoslovakia. So you see how the global trade also comes in here. And they came to know, be known as the bead buys. And so you have women as entrepreneurs here. One such body decker is known as the Iman Kiki, which is a circular beaded neck to chest ornament. And you have the main protagonist, Sakina, who builds up this relationship with a Messiah elder who teaches her how to make an Iman Kiki. And therefore, the contact goes beyond the customary trader customer relationship. And what emerges is an intercultural sisterhood through the art of beadwork. And this artistic practice that is imbibed by Sakina sheds light on an unknown aspect of lives of Indian women in East Africa in terms of their cross-cultural engagement on an artistic plane, which again adds to the complex layers of the formation of the Asian Indian identity. In his next novel, Home Between Crossing, he takes up the motif of the kanga, the kanga cloth. Okay? So you see how he kind of interweaves his material artifacts and the kanga also has this history of being very central to trade that has taken place between the Indian coast and the East African coast for a number of years. And the kanga then becomes representative of a lot of trans-oceanic exchanges that has taken place between members of the community. This one of the Swahili women handles, hands over the kanga to Som uh, Somji's main protagonist and says the kanga was bequeathed to us, the Swahili women of the coast of Africa by our ancestral slave mothers in the households of wealthy Arab royals, merchants, and sailors of the Indian Ocean. The cloth carries love in it and sorrows of our heart. It speaks wisdom in the elder's mind and shows colors in patterns of sea, water, and migrations. Together they speak lyrics of cloth art of the Indian Ocean. Somji has an entire chapter, okay? Uh, uh, this is what I meant when earlier I said you can use a literary narratives to excavate as a starting point for your excavation of archival family memories. This is a plight of three teenage women who set sail on a dhow to Mombasa from Bombay. And it's known as the Three Sisters, this chapter in his book. 
And these three sisters are escaping from a kota or brothel in Kamathipura in Mumbai, Bombay, which to date remains the largest red light area in the world. Okay? Kamathipura, we are told, historians tell us, initially housed European prostitutes with whom colonial police and army socialized, but these women were soon outnumbered by Indian prostitutes. And you have these three women who are trying to flee Kamathipura on this ship for East Africa in the hope that when they arrive there, they will find a better alternate life. And the subtext of the chapter indicates that the decision of these women to take a chance to freedom are based on accounts they had heard of other Kota women like them who had sailed on ships to Fiji, South America and the Caribbean. Yet on arrival, these women find themselves in a brothel in Nairobi, used to service male laborers bought in by the British for the construction of the railway line. Okay. The unofficial sanction of such brothels was on the lines of complicity of colonial authorities in promoting the sex trade in Indian townships along with the British cantonments in places like Lucknow and Kamathipuram in Bombay such that by 1904, prostitution in Nairobi had become rampant. There are references to prostitution in Neera Kapoor Jens, uh, um, Dromson's from Jhelum to Tana also. And she describes how many of the women who lived in India, pleasure seeker paradise in Nairobi, came from the red light district of the famous Hira Mandi Kothas in Lahore. But what is interesting is that both Somji and Dromson point out to how, of, how some of these prostitutes were eventually integrated into the Asian community, married and had children of their own. But the rest of the history of this um, part of the gendered history in East Africa is totally effaced. The community does not record it anyway, nor does the community talk about it. This returns us back to the question of how liberatory was a new home space for ostracized women like widows and prostitutes who set sail from India. The ideology of widowhood is central to Parita Mukta's Shards of Memory, which is a biographical reconstruction of the life narrative of her paternal grandmother, Ba, married at 13 and widowed at 33. And her grandmother's story of widowhood takes place in a communally racially stratified section of Nairobi of the 1920s and is a scathing critic on the Hindu Gujarati community in East Africa. There is this palatable anger of Mukta at how the community inscribed a feudal, uh, imposed a feudally inscribed widowhood upon her grandmother who joined the ranks of expelled women in the walls of the communal compound clad in a white sado, a white cotton sari of the Hindu woman's garb. The narrative leads to an exploration of the larger cultural history of widowhood in the diaspora, wherein as Mukta points out, and I quote, widows and the unspoken, dimly articulated narratives remain as the unhealed wounds in the social memory of history of migration, settlement, transformation, and the very real gains achieved in the lives of the women in my family. In terms of, again, the other, we have references in Shards of Memory to her maternal great-grandmother who asserted her independence by migrating as a single woman to a small town in Moshi, to teach at the Agadan school. And we also have mention of qualified Marathi-speaking midwives of Thais who were recruited by the Gujarati community to perform the unclean task of assisting in birthing processes of women from other Asian communities. My talk till now has been focused on the first leg of migration to East Africa but it has to be seen in continuity. By the post-independence phase, the Asian community 
in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania were compelled to relocate to the West due to political and economic factors and the growing resentment which eventually led to the nationalization of property and the expulsion of families from these countries. In many ways, it is this trauma and the need for healing that propels the next generation and the double diaspora, those who relocated from these African countries to Britain, to Canada, to Australia. It's a need for a sense of healing and to come to terms with trauma that propels the next generation to construct the perspective of the past from the perspective of post-memory. This kind of brings us back to the concept of diasporic subjectivity. There is this sense of being dispersed. There is a sense of sustained spatial connectors. There is a sense of in-betweenness and ambivalence. A sense of the notion of separation, which is governed by tropes of trauma, memory, and loss. But central to everything is a use of memory as a central trope. This is a small photo of my father, whose face is blurred. This is a moment when my family crossed over from Tanzania into Zambia due to the overnight nationalization of all jobs in Tanzania. I am absent from the photo. But this is a moment of trauma that my mother repeatedly has returned to. And her repeated telling of the story gives me access to the moment and brings the notion of post-memory, that this memory almost becomes my own, although I have never participated in the memory myself. And I would therefore conclude by um, pointing out that however much you draw upon the trope of memory, we must keep in mind the problematics in the use of memory as a means of structuring reconstructions of the past. Narratives as such as what I have shared with you are undoubtedly meticulously researched from archival sources and supporting sources of scholarship. But the creative core of the narrative is derived from intergenerational transmission of memory from within the family, where the family becomes a site of privilege, privileged site of transmission, Acts of memory involve a process of selection and omission, and therefore the use of memory as a structural device needs to be a subject of critique as a process of selective remembering and selective amnesia are linked to larger political processes. I think I have exceeded the time, so I'll just take one minute to round up. I'm sorry for that. For those outside the diaspora, okay, there may be a sense that, okay, this is all fine for people who are keenly emotionally tied to the diaspora. But what about for those of us who are outside the diaspora? What meaning can we find in these texts? How can we attempt a South-South rubric to establish a continuum between gendered experiences across these different spaces, Caribbean, East Africa, and the gendered experiences of women in the context of social reform movements of late 19th century and early 20th century in India, so that migrant narratives cease to be read in terms of a singular experience, but rather in terms of historical and cultural connections, which in turn allow us to embrace cross-border textualities. How can these questions be used to frame and address and posit further questions on freedom, subservience, and agency. How can the narratives move from being exclusive to the lives of the passengers and indentured movement women to re-belong to the sending location of India? And how can we further cul cultivate a gender-sensitive approach to ensure a continuous and sustained dialogue on the interface of diaspora, gender, and identity issues. Thank you.
I'm just taking in the silence. Perhaps it's a new area. Uh, Hello, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, it was a quite wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, I have a small doubt. When you were talking about uh, the book, Colleague Women, you just uh, uh, flag posted uh, uh, while talking about the story of a, a woman in that book. And you said that uh, naming and mis misnaming was a major part of her story. So I want I uh, I want a little bit more explanation of the naming and misnaming part of it. What happens is when you talk about identity, then identity becomes, in many ways, identity fixed by names that are given in the process of identity being allocated. And one thing that happens with many of these archives is specific identity then turns, turns into numerical values. So for example, if you say that this was a percentage of women who took the journey, or this was a percentage of indentured who went, or you're just talking in terms of statistical numbers, and you're not talking about individual stories, or you're talking about individual pride, or talking about individual trauma, then in that process, people tend to get denamed. And so when you start telling the stories, in that process, you're actually giving the individual back their identity and renaming them in that process. Uh, it has been a very well-researched and um, combining very interesting methods, which perhaps I have not come across earlier. Uh, the emphasis on memory, of course, we have been having certain uh, techniques going to the uh, study of the memories connecting uh, those who are not available to the written records anyway. I think what you have done is an absolutely excellent work and uh, um, I wish you great luck to bring it out in uh, greater strength. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I had a question. Um, uh, the, the whole experience of the diasporic independence conspiracy, <laughs> uh, the, the, the entire experience, that contemporary experience of diasporic individuals, uh, post-colonial diasporic individuals, is not a very pleasant one. Um, I, in, in, in traditionally older post-colonial countries, it's different. Uh, but what, in a certain sense, unites them today is this slightly exaggerated, uh, inflamed insecurity about an imaginary past that they seem to be clinging on to. Um, which engenders a rather sorry politics. Um, are there roots uh, of this present in the first two stages of the diasporic experience that you delineated? When you look at the fundamental definition of diaspora itself, um, you know, there's an interesting... Um, metaphor that's used, uh, it's called the umbilical cord. So there is the argument that the diaspora attempts to sustain the umbilical cord through number of spatial connectors. It could be food, it could be dress, it could be religion, it could be language. Because that's what helps them to retain some sense of collective identity which they fear they would lose otherwise. In the first uh, and earlier generations of diaspora, uh, this is what kept the community kind of uh, cohesive as a community because it was religion, it was food habits, it was all that, that happened. Okay? So I think that 
If you call this a fundamental defining characteristic of the diaspora, definitely it's been there earlier. But in the recent past, there has been the politics of the sending nation, of the Indian nation state, which is very cleverly playing on this sense of ultimately who does your heart or mind belong to. There was no interest in the diaspora at all until the 1980s and when it became economic. And that is what that is a problem with the old Indian diaspora where they say that there was no sense of saying that you belong to part of the larger Indian land and you are also Indians because there was no economic investment there. But by the time you come to the 80s and 90s and you realize that there's a huge economic, um, what you say, um, interest, okay? And then you play on this sentiment that look, ultimately wherever you've gone, you are still Indian and you still in retain your Indianness. So that sense of, of ultimate sense of belonging which has been cultivated generationally then starts coming to the fore. Okay? And there is also the question of how many generations does it take for a diaspora to stop becoming a diaspora. Because if you stop feeling this sense of ultimately part of me is connected to the sending nation and you're able to break that then are you still diasporic? Okay, So that's another debate that's coming. When you're transnational and you say that I neither, earlier it was I neither belonged here nor did I belong there. Now it is I belong here and I belong there. Okay, So how does that change the complexity of how an individual perceives self-identity? So I would say yes, it was there, but the degrees and how it gets played upon that is something that has come to the fore and I think social sciences would be a much better kind of, of a much better expertise on that also. Yeah. Hi, Valen. Well, uh, thank you for the lecture. If I got you right, um, you said using memory as a tool for research it's quite interesting, useful, but at the same time has its own problems because it selectively chooses and erases as well. From your own lecture, the example you gave of an archive where <clears throat> Mr. Shah plus two, Mrs. Shah plus two, I would say archives of all kinds, including historical records or ethnography, are selective. So it's not exclusive to memory, True. but also to other modes of uh, mm -hmm. and methods of research. So I just wanted your take on that. And also, instead of, um, to me, to my mind, uh, instead of uh, terming the diaspora, diaspora as de-territorialized, I'm not sure if re-territorialized works better. I, I haven't worked in this area at all, but I was just wondering. I agree with you absolutely. I mean, I don't think that there can be anything that works without omission and selection. I don't think there can be anything that we could kind of just say, uh, there, there is no kind of intervention that says what will be and what will not be. It works with the way we, we frame our curriculum also, the way we decide our syllabus, okay? So everything works at the level of that. My only caution when we are using memory is that one has to look at a bit of the pi or, um, political intent um, behind the writing of literary texts also. Because we tend to look at literary texts many times as being apolitical. Uh, political in the sense whether it is gender politics or any other politics. So it's not just the story of a family. It's a story of a family that's being reconstructed with a particular intent. So I think students need to be cautioned about that. Okay? As long as you keep that at the back of your mind, then, then nothing becomes an uh, ultimate or ultimate truth of whatever you're looking at. 
And this question about deterritorized, reterritorized, delocated, dislocated, relocated, unlocated, um, coming back to the issue that if you are reterritorized, if you tend to believe that yes, the territory to which I now belong is my territory, or I belong, okay? and you no longer have a sense of ambivalence or in-betweenness, then again you relate, come back to the debate of, is that a diasporic subjectivity? Because diasporic subjectivity, when you're trying to define it in literary writing, you're looking for moments of ambivalence, hyphenated identity, unbelonging, negotiation. So uh, I'm not really sure. I, I also feel that perhaps sometimes we kind of overplay these terms. Yeah, this is more of a response, both to Jyotirmai and to your response to Soumya, I think. Um, at one level, I, um, you know, when you look the old and the new, she's looked at the old uh, to a large extent the literary and the political, economic, social, you know, these are the ways, the lenses we look at diaspora. And I think our own location as to what we want, what the nation state wants, the establishment of the Overseas Indian Ministry, the beginning of the Pravasi Bharati Adivas, and the NRI, the PIO, the OCI, the PIO saying, where was an India when my ancestors left? There was no India at that particular point of time. And now, are you going to give us the OCI status or not? Is very much linked to what she said. Can you give us some money so that we give you an OCI status? So where does that, you know, back and forth go? So I think at one level, while we are pointing fingers at the diasporic interest in recreating nations, um, whether, you know, it's the Greek, the Jews, the um, Khalistan, whatever you want to talk about it, or at our end, how are we trying to use, and that's where Mala was going, how are we trying to use the diaspora to benefit our own interests. I think it works both ways. And uh, definitely, after 75 years of independence, and maybe since my um, you know, point of entry usually is the middle of the 20th century in the diaspora, if you look at Lyndon Johnson, 1964, some of those milestones, then we are also seeing the transformation of a professional diaspora into a, what Tejaswini Niranjana and others were looking at, the new subaltern diaspora. And how does this group of people try to benefit us? So there is also a lot of expectation from the diaspora today by India. I think we need official, official India. There is a lot of expectation and whether to, and that expectation is met and there is the official response on that side and there is the more intellectual response as well and the apadurai kind of uh, re-territorialization and deterritorialization again went back into a very different uh, uh, thing about the scapes, I suppose. I also uh, think that we are entering a stage when we have to look at uh, movement now as mobility and not migration. Because when you look at um, uh, the 21st century and student mobility patterns, the intention of going and migrating, setting up roots somewhere, building up a life that way, somewhere else, perhaps those patterns have changed. Okay? 
And when you have this frequent traveling back and forth, I think we are at, uh, entering spaces of transnationalism rather than diaspora. And one will have to look at the term diaspora. That's why I started off by saying that it's being used in a very, very uh, loose manner, in a very, very generalized manner. Uh, so, meaning wherever you use the term, then maybe it would be important to qualify in what manner are you using or in what context are you using the word term. Now, if earlier diaspora um, scholars said that one of the characteristics of a diaspora is a large movement of a large group of people moving from one location to another, dislocated from one location, relocated in another, but sustaining but sustaining through spatial connectors a link with the sending society and through sustaining it, sustaining a sense of identity of belonging with the original mother culture. Okay? And that leads to second and third generation feeling a sense of ambivalence of neither belonging, non-belonging, what Baba refers to as a liminal space, a place of almost but not quite. Okay? And that happened because of distances. Distances in terms of communication, in distances in terms of physical distances, distances in terms of contact. Today, when you can bring India into your living room, in whichever country you are in, and when you can travel back home at any point of time that you want to, then are we still looking at communities that are being formed as diasporic. I really have a lot of questions on that. When you have a lot of people who are talking about today's context and still using terms like diaspora, because there are shifting mobilities and then there are a lot of shifting related, um, I would say, uh, concepts that go with it and connotations that also go with it. I feel honored to be here today to deliver the word of thanks. First of all, I would like to thank the speaker, Professor Mala Panduran, for her insightful lecture on the topic, Old Indian Diaspora and Trans-Oceanic Imageries, a comparative reading from a gendered perspective. I would like to thank you on behalf of the Center for the Study of Indian Diaspora and the School of Social Sciences for finding time in your busy schedule and to be here with us today with this thought-provoking lecture. Thank you, ma'am. Next, I would like to thank Professor Jodhurmai Sharma, Dean, School of Social Sciences, for his tireless efforts and commitment in making this Golden Jubilee Distinguished Lecture Series possible. Thank you, sir. I'd like to extend my uh, gratitude to the IOE for their collaboration with the School of Social Sciences and for the financial support. I would like to thank Professor Ajay K. Sahu, Head, Center for the Study of Indian Diaspora, for chairing this session and inviting the distinguished lecturer to deliver this speak. Next, my thanks to the student volunteers who worked behind the lecture series to make it happen as a flawless one. I also thank the staffs of the Dean's Office and the C.V. Raman Auditorium for their support. Last but not the least, I would like to extend my gratitude to the audience present here today. Thanks to all the faculties and scholars for attending this lecture and making it a remarkable one. Thank you one and all. <laughs>